Chile's Chamber of Deputies has approved a bill that will allow citizens to withdraw 10% of their pension funds. The COVID-19 death toll worldwide has now surpassed 583,000, with over 13.5 million cases confirmed. Ethiopia started filling the Grand Renaissance Dam this Wednesday. From the headquarters of Telisa English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South and I'm Katrina Goss. And we begin in Chile, where the Chamber of Deputies has approved a bill that would allow citizens to withdraw 10% of their pension funds. With 97 votes in favour, 36 against and 22 abstentions, the Bill on Early Pension Withdrawals received the approval of deputies. According to the legislation, members will be able to withdraw up to 4.4 million pesos from their pension funds. The Bill will now go to the Senate, where it will also be debated for its final approval. This measure seeks to offer relief faced with the current economic crisis aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. For Chileans, it also represents a first step to eliminating pension fund administrators and reforming the country private pension scheme. And thousands of people defied the curfew on Tuesday and held a national pot-banging protest to demand the approval of the bill on early pension fund withdrawals. Demonstrators in various cities of the country took to the streets to demand the approval of the bill to allow citizens access to their savings in order to face the economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Protesters also rejected the attempt by the Sebastian Piñera government to stop the bill by implementing an aid package that would benefit the middle class and poses multiple requirements while leaving out 70% of the population. <laughs> It is getting harder here to put food on the table. Soup kitchens are being opened in many places of our city. There are more than 15 soup kitchens working. People do not have enough money to pay basic commodities, and what the government does is getting more debts and giving 100,000 pesos bonds. In Chile, no one is able to live with 200,000 or 300,000 pesos. We have no way of working right now. Most men work in construction. Working women have lost their job, and the government has only defended companies. Today they come out and offer 500,000 pesos, but it never reaches the people. We now demand the return of the pension funds because it's our money. It's not a gift from the government. That money belongs to us workers. In Colombia, former guerrillas from the FARC EP have been forced to leave the reincorporation zone in St. Lucia, a Tuango municipality, in the face of multiple violent incidents. During the early hours of Wednesday morning, 93 former combatants who signed the peace agreement together with their families began their relocation to the municipality of Mutata. They claim that the forced and massive displacement is the result of state abandonment and this lack of security guarantees. The group has announced the murder of 11 people who signed the agreement and one of their children. In view of this situation, they demand dignified treatment and that the government of Ivan Duque respects the implementation of the peace agreement. And in this context, Rodrigo Granda, in charge of the Commission for Monitoring, Promoting and Verifying the Implementation of the Final Agreement, denounced the continuous threats and assassinations of former guerrillas. We continue to denounce the murders of those who signed the peace agreement. 217 former FARC guerrillas murdered, and also from the People's Movement, from human rights defenders. Now the extreme right seems to be adopting a new tactic, threatening personalities. There is talk of threats to the Archbishop of Cali and the governor of La Magdalena by Hernan Firaldo's paramilitary forces. This Wednesday, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo claimed he had new evidence about alleged human rights violations in Venezuela. Regarding Venezuela, the U.N. has found yet more harrowing evidence of gross human rights violations by the illegitimate Maduro regime, citing more than 1,300 extrajudicial executions for political reasons in 2020 alone. International pressure on Maduro must continue until the Venezuelan people can reclaim their democracy. Regarding Venezuela, the UN has found yet more harrowing evidence 
of gross. And in response to the recent statements of the US Secretary of State, Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arriaza stressed the false nature of the accusations on Twitter. In a tweet, the Venezuelan Foreign Minister affirmed that Pompeo's advisers give him fake and manipulated information on United Nations reports. He also noted that his advisers failed to alert him of the demands contained within those same reports for the immediate lifting of his government's illegal, unilateral, coercive measures against Venezuela. And our correspondent in Havana, Laura Palmero, brings us a roundup of news from the Caribbean region. Thanks for the contact. These are the most recent stories and news from Caribbean countries. And the Dominican Republic Health Minister informed about COVID-19 situation in the country today. The Dominican Republic Health Minister informed that the deaths from the novel coronavirus rose 910. As for those infected, 3,471 are in hospital isolation and more than 18,000 in the same state, but in their homes. Of the total number of confirmed cases, the average age is 38. The provinces with the highest number of COVID-19 infections are the National District, Santo Domingo and Santiago. The average age of the deceased are 65, 67% of whom are men who had a history of chronic disease, such as high blood pressure and diabetes. The plenum of the Central Electoral Board today proclaimed Luis Abinader and Raquel Peña as president and vice president, respectively, for the period 2020-2024. Abinader and Peña were received by Central Electoral Board president. During the ceremony of delivery of the certificates, president thanked the Dominican people for sovereignly coming to exercise the right to vote in the presidential and congressional elections of July 5. The activity took place in the Plaza de la Bandera in the Dominican capital. In San Lucia, the chief medical officer, Dr. Sharon Bellman George, provided an update on a new COVID 19 case in San Lucia. She reported the existence of one new positive case of COVID 19. The individual is a 27. Seven-year-old male, a returning national who arrived in San Lucia last Friday, July 10, 2020. Upon arrival, he was tested and placed in institutional quarantine. The Ministry of Health and Wellness once again reiterates the importance of quarantine as a measure to minimize the risk of transmitting COVID-19. This action is expected to protect the health and safety of every individual within the country. In her presentation, highlighted about the details of procedures in the fifth phase of reopening. As we move to the fifth phase of the reopening of the sector, which is of highest risk to the population, we anticipate the introduction of cases with both returning nationals and tourist arrivals. Therefore, we remind the public on the importance of the protocols as we continue to manage COVID-19. All sectors are encouraged to adhere to the public health protocols, which include the recommended physical distancing, regular hand washing with soap and water, and the proper use of the face mask or scarf. At this stage, practically all of the sectors have reopened and the public is reminded that mass crowd events are still closed. And Jamaican Minister of Local Government and Community Development, Desmond Mackenzie, informed about the delivery of 100 house solutions in the country today. He informed that over the last year, 32 houses have been built and handed over to beneficiaries, with another 12 to be constructed by the end of the financial year. He was speaking at the handover of a house that indigent family in Long Road, Poland. Minister Mackenzie said that the beneficiaries on the indigent housing program have served the country in various areas, such as health and security. And while they are falling on hard times, the best care must be given to them. He also added that the ministry is looking at increasing the funds allocated to the municipal corporation for social housing assistance. Last time I was here when I engaged, Mr. Gibson he told me that he served this country in the security forces. I don't remember if you say it was JDF, sir. In the Jamaica Defense Force. And these are the men and women who have served the country. But somewhere along the line, they were forgotten. And these are the most recent stories and news from Caribbean countries. Let's go back with you in the studio. 
Thank you, Laura, and we're taking a very short break now, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The COVID-19 death toll worldwide has now surpassed 583,000, with over 13.5 million cases confirmed. According to the World Health Organization, half of the cases have been reported in the Americas, home to more than 7.1 million. Europe, the second most affected region, has reported over 2.6 million cases, followed by the Middle East with 1.3 million. The surge in COVID-19 cases continues in the Americas, as well as in South Asia and Africa. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for a commitment to multilateralism to help protect and bolster the global economy as the COVID-19 pandemic has started to cause major setbacks and threatens the livelihoods of billions of people. I'm not here today to tell you that everything will be okay. We need to be honest with ourselves. The COVID-19 crisis is having devastating impacts because of our past and present failures. Working hours, equivalent to some 400 million jobs, were lost in the second quarter of 2020. And we are experiencing the sharpest decline in per capita income since 1870. Between 7 and 100 million people could be pushed into extreme poverty. And some 265 million could face acute food insecurity by year's end, double the number at risk before the crisis. And the impact of this pandemic is falling disproportionately on the most vulnerable. At a time when we desperately need to leap ahead, COVID-19 could set us back years and even decades, leaving countries with massive fiscal and growth challenges. The European Commission has warned EU member states of the potential effect of COVID-19's interaction with seasonal flu come autumn and called on governments to better coordinate strategies to counter a possible second wave of the pandemic. Since actions converge, the situation of course got better and this is the approach we want to apply in the future. We do not want to see the lack of coordination that we uh, that governed the initial reaction of our member states at the beginning of the pandemic. Second. Vice President Sinas mentioned the interaction of the seasonal flu with COVID-19. Uh, yes, I call it the cocktail effect. And this is something that we may be encountering, that we did not encounter early on in the year, four months ago. And we are raising in this communication the need for member states to be prepared for this. Tokyo's governor issued a warning on Wednesday about the escalating spread of the coronavirus in the Japanese capital, requesting that residents and business owners step up preventative measures. Regarding beds for moderately ill patients, we have requested medical institutions to secure 2,700 beds in line with level 2. In addition, due to the increasing number of asymptomatic, mildly ill patients in the younger generation, we will open to new accommodation medical facilities tomorrow, on 16 and next week. Please avoid going to restaurants that do not have adequate infection control measures. Avoid using shops that are not sanitized, ventilated or where people don't wear masks. Renewed restrictions took effect in Hong Kong on Wednesday as the Asian Financial Center battles a resurgence of COVID-19. The decision comes after the Special Administrative Region recorded 52 new confirmed COVID-19 cases on Monday, of which 41 are believed to have been locally transmitted. Public gatherings are once again restricted to four people after the limit was eased last month to allow up to 50. Restaurants are limited to takeout after 6 p.m. and mask wearing has been made compulsory on public transport for the first time. Those not wearing a mask face fines up to 650 US dollars. About 300 new cases have been reported since July 6, including more than 220 locally transmitted cases. 
Chinese President Xi Jinping has stressed that China's diplomacy has contributed to the global fight against the COVID-19 pandemic and called for efforts to establish regional emergency liaison mechanisms to enable a quicker response to public health emergencies. China supports the World Health Organization in leading the global efforts to develop science-based and proper control and treatment and minimize cross-border spread. I call on G20 members to enhance anti-epidemic information sharing with the support of the WHO and promote control and treatment protocols that are comprehensive, systematic and effective and call a high-level meeting on international public health security in due course. This Wednesday, a spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry stressed that China strongly opposes the United Kingdom's ban on Huawei. Does the United Kingdom want to keep its independent position, or does it willingly think to become dependent on America and become America's dupe? The United Kingdom, with no concrete evidence, under the pretext of risks which don't exist at all, has cooperated with the United States to discriminate against, oppress and exclude Chinese enterprises, blatantly violating principles of the market economy and free trade, breaching promises that the United Kingdom has already made a making a wrong decision, severely damaging Chinese companies' interests and seriously impacting the basis of mutual trust for China-UK cooperation. China strongly opposes this. The United Kingdom's choice to ban Huawei will harm the United Kingdom's own interests. The world is big, the United Kingdom is relatively small. I think no matter what, this ban will not prevent Huawei's development and growth. President of the United States Donald Trump signed new legislation this Wednesday applying sanctions against the People's Republic of China for allegedly oppressing freedom of speech under the national security law in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Today I signed legislation and an executive order to hold China accountable for its oppressive actions against the people of Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Autonomy Act, which I signed this afternoon, passed unanimously through Congress. This law gives my administration powerful new tools to hold responsible the individuals and the entities involved in extinguishing Hong Kong's freedom. And the U.S. president also said that he had signed an executive order to end U.S. trade preferences for Hong Kong, stating that Hong Kong will now be treated the same as mainland China. Today I also signed an executive order ending U.S. preferential treatment for Hong Kong. Hong Kong will now be treated the same as mainland China. No special privileges, no special economic treatment, and no export of sensitive technologies. In addition to that, as you know, we're placing massive tariffs and have placed very large tariffs on China. First time that's ever happened to China. And in response to U.S. moves this Wednesday, China announced that it will sanction U.S. entities involved in the bill against the Hong Kong national security law. In response to the recently approved Hong Kong Autonomy Act signed by President Donald Trump, the Chinese Foreign Ministry issued a statement denouncing that the legislation goes against international law. The Foreign Ministry stressed that it represents crude interference in the internal affairs of China. For this reason, China will impose sanctions on U.S. citizens and organizations involved with the Hong Kong Autonomy Act. Over 41,000 people, including soldiers and firefighters, are working in rescue and recovery efforts following floods in East China's Jiangxi province. Just since Monday, the extensive floods have affected more than 5 million people in the province. The continued heavy rainfall has caused extensive damages, with many river embankments collapsing, while industrial parks, as well as residential communities across several regions of China, have been heavily impacted. We have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us.
Ethiopia started filling its Grand Renaissance Dam on Wednesday. The decision was addressed by the Ethiopian Water Minister, Seleshi Bekele, a day after talks with Sudan and Egypt over the giant hydroelectric project became deadlocked. The failure of talks on Monday sank hopes that the three countries could resolve their differences and sign an agreement on the dam's operation before Ethiopia began filling it. Addis Ababa had previously pledged to start storing water in the dam's fast reservoir at the start of the wet season in July, when rains flood the Blue Nile. It will literally take South Africa's cases of COVID-19 are set to reach 300,000 this Wednesday, the highest figure in Africa and among the top 10 in the world. Africa's most industrialized nation has over 298,000 cases, according to the last count, despite a swiftly imposed lockdown aimed at preventing infections spiraling, as they did in Europe and the Americas. Positive tests have now increased at a rate of more than 10,000 a day. The African country registers the world's fourth largest daily increase in coronavirus cases in a country of 58 million people. President Cyril Ramaphosa reimposed a ban on alcohol sales and a nightly curfew on Sunday. The signing of a partial peace deal between the Sudanese government and an alliance of armed groups has been delayed, the Mediation Committee announced on Tuesday. The partial agreement was the result of negotiations between the Sudanese authorities in Khartoum and the armed alliance, which includes the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, the Sudan Liberation Movement and the Justice and Equality Movement. However, the agreement excludes some of the influential armed groups in the country. The deal was due to bring an end to the dispute between the Sudanese government and groups in Darfur and South Kordofan, among other areas of the nation. According to a deal signed between the government and then Southern Sudan in two French President Emmanuel Macron met Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez in Paris on Wednesday to discuss European Union coronavirus recovery measures. France and Germany had proposed creating a one-off 500 billion euro recovery fund that would be paid for through shared EU borrowing. That proposal was then expanded by the EU Commission, which put forward plans for a 750 billion euro fund made up mostly of grants. However, the proposal has faced resistance from Austria, Denmark, the Netherlands and Sweden, who are reluctant to grant the funds without further conditions. Tensions briefly escalated in Sofia, Bulgaria, after a group of young men attempted to break into the parliament building, but were stopped by police. Protesters threw bottles and flammable liquids at police and at least two officers were injured. Meanwhile, thousands of mostly young Bulgarians took to the streets for the seventh day in a row to protest against the government and the country's top prosecutor, accusing them of corruption and links to criminal groups. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.